In this video, I'm going to try and answer some questions that people have about NLP. So just a bit about my background. I have a science background and spent 12 years at the University of WA as a laboratory technician. One of my roles was also um, departmental photographer, hence my uh, interest in uh, making YouTube videos. And while working at UWA, I was also studying psychology part-time at Curtin and then Murdoch Universities, but I, um, I burned out. I burned out from working myself into the ground, so I had to drop out. I then got involved with a uh, meditation group, and that was when the real journey of self-discovery began. I was introduced to uh, NLP and hypnosis by an American psychologist who was part of that group. Um, she ran a course on psychic skills, which was a really, really interesting course because it was exploration of consciousness. It was really good. Anyway, so what is NLP? NLP, it's a uh, model of applied psychology. And as Richard Bandler puts it, it is a modeling methodology. So psychiatrists and psychologists, they tend to focus on why someone has a problem. NLP is more results oriented and um, an NLP is not so much interested in why someone has a problem, just in achieving a desired outcome. And what Richard Bandler noticed was that um, a top salesperson would hold a sales training workshop, for example. Um, yet the result was the normal, you know, the normal distribution curve. So some participants made little improvement, most made average improvement, while a few ex um, excelled. So this indicated that the salesperson, that the trainer, didn't understand how his mental processes made him the successful person that he was. And this isn't just about salespeople, it's about anybody who's at the top of the profession. Um, typically they don't really understand what makes them a success. They'll give all sorts of explanations, but it's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so what NLPers did, and still do, to a certain extent, was to model out the mental processes that people at the top of their profession used, and then you transfer those processes to other people. And the results achieved have been absolutely amazing. I've helped people stop gambling in one, one two-hour session. The gamblers are spending $1,000 a week. Um, and I've followed them up long term too, right? And I've also helped people quit you know, smoking marijuana in a couple of hours. And there was one guy, he said, if you just knew how much I smoked, I only took 90, 90 minutes for that guy. And there have been a number of times where I've helped people quit alcohol in as little as four hours. You know, these were hardcore drinkers, you know. On one occasion, it was only a two-hour session. So, but as each person's actually different, you know, there's always exceptions. So with other people, it has taken longer. And it is always really useful to for you, get your clientele to um, have additional um, coaching sessions to sustain their outcomes. But anyway, the point is, if there's one person in the world who can do something, if there is one person in the world who has achieved something, then the outcome may also be possible for you. Um, in brief, what you have to do is look at the NLP well-formed outcome uh, questions, and that's in my other videos, it's on my website for you to have a look at. Anyway, before we go any further, I need to make a point. NLP is a modeling process that leaves behind a trail of techniques. Often when people think of NLP, they often think of the techniques. Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> and I even saw an article on the internet just a few days ago with a statement. This is the first words of this great big article. It says NLP is a technique. No, NLP is not a technique. NLP is a modeling methodology. <laughs> NLP is a model of applied psychology that gives you a way of looking at the world and making ecological changes. Okay, so enough said about that. So who founded NLP? Let's have a look at the uh, website. Who founded NLP? 
So Richard Bandler is credited with discovering the NLP modeling process in the early 1970s when he inadvertently modeled Fritz Perls. According to John Grinder, Bandler and Frank Puslik were highly skilled in both modeling and guest out therapy by the time he started working with them in 1974. John was originally co-opted to turn what Bandler and Puslik uh, could already do into a coherent model they could teach to others. Credit also needs to be given to a host of other co-developers who played a part in its development as a field. Bandler went on to develop design human engineering, Grinder developed a new code NLP, Anthony Robbins developed neuroassociative conditioning, Michael, Hel Michael L. Hall developed neurosemantics, and many others have developed their own change models based upon the original NLP model. If you have an interest in studying NLP, it's recommended that you study some of the early books and training materials in order to gain understanding of the spirit in which NLP was created. And I'll actually make a video at some time. I'll go through a lot of the earlier books and it's really worth watching some of the older videos that um, Richard Bandler made back around 1987. Okay, so what is neurolinguistic programming, shortened to NLP? NLP is a behavioral and cognitive psychology that grew out of the human potential movement of the 1960s. Some of the key players in the human potential movement were William James, Aldous Huxley, Carl Rogers, Victor Frankl, Fritz Perls, Virginia Satir, Gregory Bates, and Amoshi Feldenkrais. NLP was also developed at a time where hypnosis was not looked upon favorably by the mainstream psychology and medical professions. NLP then became a way to covertly employ hypnosis. So for me back in the um, mid 80s, it was illegal for anyone but a registered psychologist to practice hypnosis. So that was one of the motivators for me to come across to the east coast of Australia. Um, okay, so NLP. And neurology from neurology, our senses, that's the abstractors, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, gustatory, that's the V-A-K-O-G, are the closest contact we have with the territory and abstract the information. Linguistics refer to the way that language affects our perception of the world and creates behaviors. Programming refers to the notion that the neural network pathways are programmed to work in predictable ways. NLP is a methodology of modeling. It is the process of recognizing patterns of excellence and defining them in such a way that others can use them. NLP requires both an attitude of curiosity and scientific but playful approach to experiment beyond the traditional paradigms. NLP is not so much interested in the why, but in the how to get results. And when you think of it, someone has a health problem, they don't care why, they just want to get a they just want to get healthy. Someone, you know, is poor, they don't care why they're poor, they want to know how to make money. Okay, so major influences on NLP are as follows. General semantics, non-Aristotelian systems, Alfred Korzybski. It's worth reading his books, they're pretty heavy, but they're really interesting. That's where we get the uh, term the map is not the territory. Transformational grammar, it's an evolution from general semantics. A change in the structure of language affects behavior. So you do a link, learn to do a linguistic analysis. It's in the words, it's in what people say. Logical levels, step to an ecology of mind, Gregory Bateson. Um, stimulus response conditioning with Ivan Pavlov, family therapy, Virginia Satir. Um, from where, where we get the meta model. Um, hypnosis, so it's Milton H. Erickson. He was a medical hypnotherapist um, of the last century, the Milton model. Gestalt therapy, Fritz Perls, Roddy Work, Moshe Feldenkrais. And then there's physics. This is stuff from Richard Bain, laser technology and foray patterns. He was very much into that. Uh, systems theories, like strategies. You know, we all, we all use strategies. You have to have a strategy for making a cup of tea. You know, there's a strategy for smoking a cigarette. There's a strategy for answering the phone. Everything can be broken down. Behavior can be broken down into these little strategies. Okay, so that came from Galanta, Miller, and Prebram. That's where you get the 
test, operate test, exit um, model. Uh, quantum physics, the observer influences the subject and therefore the outcome. Uh, and this is where the uh, postmodernists have gone a bit overboard with it. And psychology, William James, Principle of Psychology, 1891. And it's really worth getting a copy of the first edition. It's a really good read. Now, NLP is a process of discovery that leaves behind a trail of techniques. The techniques that are written up in the books and taught at workshops are not NLP. They are the results of applying the NLP methodology of modeling. Can't be understated, I think I said before. Um, anyway, okay, go on, Abby. So, three, what is neurosemantics? Well, neurosemantics, it was developed by um, Michael Hall and a team of co-developers, all right? He's, he wants to make that very clear that he doesn't get the, it's with a team of co-developers. Um, as an interdisciplinary field, the models of neurosemantics come from the field of the cognitive behavioral sciences, from developmental psychology, the neurosciences, general semantics, NLP, cognitive linguistics, cybernetics, and systems dynamics. The first and core model of neurosemantics is the meta states model developed in 1994 by Michael Hall. Um, so it's worth looking at neurosemantics. Coaching. What is coaching? I mean, you go online and you put in life coaching. There's millions of life coaches out there, but with all uh, different training. So coaching is the process of helping another person to access their internal and external resources and utilize, utilize those resources to achieve a design outcome that is in alignment with their highest potential. Coaching is a method to bring dreams about the future into reality of now. Coaching may involve clearing up past issues that prevent the actualization of your goals, but the focus is always on the future. Coaching in neurosemantics is called meta-coaching. Uh, coaching ma coaches may specialize in one area of expertise, for example, business coaching, performance coaching, you know, sports coaching, etc., etc. Um, yeah, business coaches, coaches focus on the structure of business, performance coaches, executive coaches. Transformational coaching has the aim of awakening the client to their life's purpose and helping them to restructure their sense of self and then build a propulsion system towards achieving their desired outcome. So then you get levels of coaching where performance coaching is focused on improving the performance of current behaviors and skills. Developmental coaching is focused on developing capabilities and new behaviors. And transformational coaching is focused on facilitating a paradigm shift at the level of identity and spirituality. Transformational coaching is what I'm passionate about. So what is hypnotherapy? Okay, so therapy is the process of healing problems that originate in the past from conditioning and life experience. Therapy gets you ready for coaching. Hypnotherapy is the process of using hypnosis for therapeutic outcomes. Combining NLP with hypnosis makes therapy more effective. Therapy may also include some elements of coaching. Um, regarding hypnosis. Okay, just very briefly. Uh, let me see. Okay, so you can read this for yourself, but the, the old, to me, the old traditional style of hypnosis is old, it's out of state, where, you know, they would, it's a direct form of hypnosis, where they hold like a watch above your eye level, and they make you go into a trance and they make you change. Stage hypnosis, I don't know. I think sometimes it may be stage hypnosis should be banned because it really gives the wrong idea and they can really mess people up. Um, so it's worth reading this here. I don't want to go through it. Uh, but Dave Hellman. 
Dave Elmer, 1900-1967. Okay, so he was pretty good. He used a direct hypnosis approach, but speeded up the process of inducing trance, usually achieving a satisfactory trance within a couple of minutes. His style is recognizable by the line, close your eyes and relax the muscles around your eyes. Um, Dave Elman also used open eye and waking trance procedures. The hypnosis that I, I use, hip, combine hypnosis with my NLP to get people off alcohol and marijuana and stop them gambling and food cravings, etc., etc. And I don't do any of the old traditional style. I, I, and I don't even really do a um, Ericksonian permissive style. Because my understanding, I have, a, I have a background in meditation as well, and one assumes that the client is already in trance. And, th and then we also assume that the person has a conscious mind and an unconscious mind. And the problem is the person is, when they're communicating with their unconscious mind through questions, statements, commands, they're not doing it in the right way. And if you just communicate with your unconscious mind in the right way, using question statements and commands and, and focusing your attention inwards and being aware of the idiomotor signals that you get from the unconscious mind, you can make changes really quickly. Um, so we'll go into that later. So then Milton Erickson's um, conversational style. So using the modeling tools, using the modeling tools of NLP, Richard Bandler and others were able to map the actual structure used in trance induction and trance utilization. That's a bit what like I've done. I've sort of worked out what the basic um, st structure actually is. Um, with the NLP style of hypnosis, a formal trance induction is usually waived and the practitioner may instead go directly for the outcome and say something to the effect, now close your eyes and go into deep trance. I don't say, go to deep trans I say I just show the person how to go uh, how to close their eyes and relax well I don't even show them how to relax I just tell them what to do what well, guide them what to do with experience the NLP hypnotherapist learns how to recognize trance from minimal cues and how to use the NLP change techniques in a conversation so for example if you would lift up say one of your arms say you lift up your right arm hold it out in front of you within a few seconds you'll actually have arm catalepsy but you just have to be able to see it. So going in and out of trance is really easy. Um, so this is the most artful form of hypnosis. But if the client is expecting traditional hypnosis with closed eyes, arm levitation, amnesia, they may feel like they have just been chatting and that they have not been hypnotized. So what you do when you're using like my style of NLP hypnotherapy you frame it in such a way that they realize that they're learning how to communicate with their unconscious mind and they change really quickly. Um, and in addition, as Eastern meditation techniques become more integrated into Western psychology, the new age and personal development models, we find a blurring between the distinctions of what is hypnosis and what is meditation. In a way, you could say that all meditation is hypnosis. Um, in fact, not only is deep hypnosis identical to deep trance, but in deep hypnosis, you're actually more aware of your experience than your normal waking state. In deep trance, you are wide awake. The mind is quiet. You feel contented, but you are not asleep. Uh, it's a little bit like being in a, I guess it's, well, it's actually a flow state. It's being in the zone. Only in rare cases do people demonstrate amnesia. But that's like when you go, to, you go to sleep or maybe you're partially asleep and you're dreaming and then as you come out of the dream and become more uh, awake, you just can't remember the dream. Um, to remember the dream, you have to go back to sleep again. So we have like conscious, unconscious mind. Okay, so clinical hypnotherapy is nothing like stage hypnosis, which actually creates false expectations of what the experience should be like. The hypnotherapist does not do things to you. They should not. They don't have power over your mind, and they cannot make you achieve your desired outcome. That is to say, hypnotherapists cannot make you stop smoking. They cannot give you confidence. They cannot make you feel motivated to exercise. 
On the contrary, the role of the hypnotherapist is to put you in the driver's seat of your mind and show you how to work the controls such that you become more responsible. To put it another way, hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness in which you learn how to get in touch with your unconscious mind and reorganize the matrices of your mind such that you're able to access inner resources and utilize outer resources to achieve your desired outcome. Okay, seven. When is hypnotherapy sufficient by itself and when are other healing modalities required? Okay, so traditional hypnosis. Okay, it's highly effective for changing bad habits such as cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, and eating problem foods, but only to a degree. If there are uh, negative events, negative emotions, trauma, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, stress, and multiple addictions, then a more cognitive, structured approach is required. Hence, we draw upon the methodology, tools, and techniques of NLP and neurosemantics. In the context of weight loss, people sometimes seek help for motivation to exercise, thinking that some hypnotherapy can be used to make them feel motivated. But motivation is not a feeling that you can attach to a behavior. Motivation is a normalization, a guest up state. People generally lack motivation because they don't have a well-defined goal or because the goal holds insufficient meaning for them or that exercise holds insufficient meaning to them. In this case, we use NLP to build a well-formed outcome and then add intentionality and value to the steps involved in taking action towards the goal. Motivation is best built using NLP, neurosemantics and conversational hypnosis rather than traditional hypnosis. All right, now I've got a section here on myths about hypnosis, um, which I'll let you read by yourself. Um, but we've just been over that. Okay, so what's the difference between traditional hypnotherapy and NLP hypnotherapy? NLP provides a methodology for identifying the structure of the mind NLP allows us to map at an unconscious process, much like a roadmap. Traditional hypnotherapy provides a method to communicate with and make suggestions to the unconscious mind, but it can be a little vague and ill-defined. For example, with traditional therapy, one may be advised to attend four to five sessions and then wait and see if you get the desired outcome. However, by combining hypnotherapy with NLP, you get immediate results while you are in the session room. By the end of the session, you should know that you have made significant changes. Oftentimes, the changes are transformational. And if you want to read about some transformational change that some of my clients have made, there's a link on my uh, website. I think it says read success stories. Okay, now, how does NLP differ from psychology and psychiatry? Both psychiatry and psychology tend to focus on the content. Hence, psychiatrists and psychologists may spend considerable time having you talk about your past problems. And then you get psychologists, uh, I mean, psych and psychiatrists especially, they will blame, you know, body chemistry brain chemistry that's the problem uh, which is not very useful at all so both psychiatry and psychology ask why the client has a problem they analyze the client until they decide upon a diagnosis which invariably means the client ends up wearing a label psychiatry and psychology are related to the medical model so where they're trying to be scientific, and that's the problem. Rather than focus on content, NLP works with the structure of the mind. NLP is solution-oriented. NLP is process-oriented. 
NLP is not interested in why you have a problem. NLP is interested in how to get a result as quickly as possible. NLP is probably not considered to be scientific by the psychological profession, but NLP is practical and methodical, and most importantly, NLP consistently gets results. Okay, so what are the applications of NLP? Somebody asked me recently, so you know, how do I make money with NLP? Well, NLP can be used as a therapy to heal the past and to help people change bad habits. Most importantly, NLP can be used to create peak performance in the areas of business, sales, health, sport, education, and learning. NLP can be used to influence most things in a person's life. The NLP models can be applied to an organization as well as an individual and can be applied to the study of any discipline such as science and religion. So now we get to it. Now we get to the nitty gritty. The principles of NLP. NLP is a study of subjective experience. The mind has a structure that can be mapped. So not so much about the content, but it's about mapping out the structure. Mind and body are not separate. There's a mind body is one system. The meaning of your communication is the response that you get. So if you don't like the um, response you're getting, just keep modifying your behavior until you get the desired response. There is no such thing as failure, there's only feedback. People are not broken, they work perfectly. And they'll have a consistency. People are patterned, they do the same things over and over again. Not because they're broken, it's just because they're running a pattern. So you just need to find a solution. If your beliefs limit you, then rather than change in the world, change your beliefs. I think we should need to uh, advertise this to the postmodernists and the cultural Marxists. <laughs> All behavior has a positive intention. The intention needs to be acknowledged. Behavior is the output of the matrices of mind. So all behavior has a positive intent. Okay, we need to add choices, not take them away. So when someone wants to um, stop drinking alcohol or eating junk food or getting angry at someone, you've got to give them choices. You've got to give them, you've got to help wire in better options for them. And that's in most cases is all that's missing. So we need to add choices, not take them away. People will always choose the best option. Now, if someone else can do it, then there's a possibility that others can too. So if someone has achieved the success that you desire, then all things being equal, you can do the same. There needs to be a sufficient degree of rapport, that's trust and respect between the coach and the client for transformational change to occur. So that's why when you work with somebody, you, you need to make sure that you create rapport. Rapport is number one. You've got to, um, you have to be authentic, but you have to create harmony with your client. That is number one. And a lot of that will come down to uh, acknowledging the person for who they are. Acknowledgement is so important. I actually did just a video on the topic of acknowledgement. Now the NLP um, practitioner, coach, hypnotherapist, however you want to call yourself, acts as a facilitator to help the client reorganize their matrices of mind. So what you're doing is you're, um, you know, you're mapping out 
the, the structure of the person's problem state, the desired outcome, and you're reflecting it back to them so that they can come to new understandings and uh, get the outcomes that they and changes that they desire. So it's all about the uh, the uh, the client. And the session outcome needs to be well formed. It's very important. Well formed, and there's a uh, video and an article on well formed outcomes, NLP well formed outcomes. Next principle: the client has all the resources they need to bring about a change. The client has all the resources they need to bring about a change. You just have to be able to access them. The client, and most importantly, the client is responsible for the changes they make. And that's why, in a way, you shouldn't really give people guarantees. Like I did that decades ago for, through a period of time. You don't give clients guarantees when you do personal development work. Um, because it puts too much responsibility, in their mind, it puts too much responsibility back onto you. And what needs to occur is for your client to make the changes. Uh, so then they take credit for the changes that occur. Um, and so that's it. If you want to read about my background, you can do so here. So that's it for this. So what is NLP? So... Where's my little note? So let's uh, leave it there. Please leave a comment below the video and feel free to send me an email from my website. I will respond. Um, you know, your input is important to me in this channel because it helps me to design the content for the next video. And you see, unless I hear from you, I have no idea what you want to watch and what you want to learn. Um, so email me, let me know what you want to learn, and I'll see what I can actually do, what I can create. Um, look, please like the video, leave a comment, and share on social media. This is really important to me. It's important for the channel because it influences the YouTube algorithms and helps the uh, video be seen by a wider range of people. And I think this is very important because there's lots of people in the world who, don't, who can't afford to get uh, NLP training, um, but they can get online training from... Uh, channels like this. All the best to you and I look forward to seeing you again. And remember to keep on challenging everything for the truth. I've spent my entire life doing that and I would like to share some of my discoveries with you. Whether you're an atheist or believe in a higher power, my book on God is sure to get you thinking. And part and parcel of spirituality is learning how to work with your unconscious mind such that you can quieten the mind and get yourself to sleep when you need to. And that includes the ability to banish bad habits like cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, chocolate, and overeating. And as a foundation to a fulfilling life, I believe everyone needs to learn how to work with their unconscious mind, how to explore deep trance and states of deep meditation. If you want to connect, you can find me on Facebook, at Abbey Eagle School of Meditation.